everyone, and welcome down to episode number 82 of the Down South Photo Show with me, Brendan Waits, here in Ocean Grove, Victoria, Australia. And the guy on the other screen or in your other ear, if you're listening to the podcast, not in Hobart, Tasmania tonight. Which everyone should be listening to the podcast. Of course, everyone should be. It's Cam Blake. Hello, Cameron. Hello, Brendan. Uh, long time no see. Uh, yes. Nice to catch up with you for another week of photography chit chat. Yes, it is long time no see. We literally caught up with each other this morning. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We we uh we saw each other for a few hours. Had a a lunch and had a well, couple we of had beers. A production so, meeting, Cameron, is what we oh, did. Oh yes, production meeting. Well, it sort of was. We used some of the free beer that had been donated to us. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So it was. Yeah, production meeting sounds good. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I'm not, meeting. I'm not in Hobart. I'm in your neck of the woods. Well, speaking of woods, um, I'm at Greensboro with mum and dad at the moment. And I've awesome. uh, got, some, got some OM days on tomorrow and Friday. And then we've got a couple of down south photo show workshops. We have. How exciting. Yeah. Um, looking forward to that. So there'll be people listening to this because it comes out Friday night who are actually yeah. doing the workshop with us tomorrow, Saturday, they if are. they're listening to it on Friday night. And yeah. um, getting very excited. It looks like the weather's looking okay. There's a, the uh, best jinx good. I've ever laid. Yeah. Now the weather should be good. And, yeah, maybe people will listen to this on the way down the freeway if they're coming down from Melbourne to our little workshop. That's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, looking forward to it. Yeah, the weather looks good and they're always a good day, a bit of fun and a bit of banter and maybe even learn some things along the way. So you've literally got four one-day workshops in a row from here on. Yeah, I do. Uh, so mm. tomorrow, yeah, OM days in the city. I'm going to try and catch a train in. Um, I'm not going to try and find a car park. When we did them earlier in the year in January, it was school holidays and stuff, so things were a little bit less busy. Um, uh-huh. So get, going to try and catch a train for the first time in a while. <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, then I'll drive down to you on Saturday, Sunday, probably crash in your couch on Saturday night, have a few beers, and then do it all again Perfect. Sunday. Perfect. Yeah. Couldn't think of anything better. Um, question without notice and completely off the run sheet. Um, I've heard it said regularly that as far as cities go, Melbourne is quite photogenic. Would you agree? Uh, it is. I think Melbourne's got um, – it's got little sections all through the city. Like the Docklands is really, really good. I find the Docklands really good for photography. Um, all the alleyways and laneways and little cafes, they're really cool. And then you've got some of the older buildings up the top end of Collins Street and stuff like that and Parliament House and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's got a – yeah, it's very photogenic. It's definitely got different eras mm. and different you know, architecture and stuff like that. And there's always something weird going on in Melbourne with people. Like there's someone <laughs> hanging off a tram or something like that. Or yeah. Well, the trams, so, yeah. the trams themselves make great photos too, don't they? Yeah, they did. We did that last uh, – earlier in the year with one of the days, the Princess Bridge near Fred Square – yeah, uh, we had some slow motion using the inbuilt neutral densities to blur the green trams going across the yeah, bridge. Yeah, very cool. But I saw on the news tonight uh, with Peter Hitchner and uh, <laughs> Fed, Fed Square. <laughs> Fed Square's got, I think they called it the Spark Festival, um, mm. and it's like fireworks, but it's with bubbles and lighting and stuff like that, which is oh. happening every night. So How we convenient. might be It just happens to be that we were meeting it and finishing at Square Fed Square. Um, so that could be pretty cool, or it'll completely screw up my plans of being around Fed Square and we'll have to tick or something on the spot. But because be there'll be 80 trillion people there, there'll be everyone and their dog and the bubble blowers all going, but oh. uh, it could be cool. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll update you next time on how that went or how that didn't go. Very good. Um, thanks to everyone who has liked, followed, and subscribed on YouTube. A uh, little minor milestone, 551 subscribers. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Growing it's all going, the time. Going, it's going up pretty well, the, the subscribers on, on the YouTubes. Yeah. Yep. And uh, back into the charts this week as well. Yeah, yeah back in the hey, – we're on the British charts. We kicked into the British charts too. Yeah, I saw that. So hello to uh, anyone who's listening in the UK, Great Britain – whatever yeah. you call it over there these days, um, England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, yeah. Northern yeah. Ireland, whatever you want. The United Kingdoms of Kingdoms. Um, That's right. But, yeah, we we came in somewhere, about 200. But if you are listening, <laughs> I know there was people in Scotland that were listening. Yeah. So if you do listen over there, um, thank yeah. you. And it'd be great to, um, again, share around your friends over there and uh, 
Yes. Yeah. We have attracted a global yeah. audience. God help us. Imagine if we made it like in the top 20 or something like that or yeah. of uh, the UK or something. We'll be like the Beatles breaking into the charts overseas. Maybe, yeah. Maybe who would like you be? Next... If you were a Beatles, who would you be? Which one? Which one would I be? Yeah, which one would you be? Oh, Jesus. Uh, that's a question without notice. Yeah, well, you gave me um, one. I'd, I'd probably, I'd like to think that I'd be Paul, but... I'm probably not. I think I'm more of a Ringo. <laughs> mm, no, okay, <laughs> right. I've never even thought about the answer to that, but I thought yeah, I'd ask you just to make you look like an idiot. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, both we're, Paul we're and Ringo up. were left-handed. Well, there you go. So maybe I'll be Paul or Ringo because, well, yeah. I'm not left-handed. I'm a left-handed golfer, but not writing Which it. is just all kinds of weird. Oh. You know they don't make cameras for left-handers just to bring it back onto some kind of photography chat? Yeah, we talk, we've spoken about that, haven't we? You gotta, we have. Yeah. Yeah, that's why so, back button focus is so useful. I sold a camera. This is a true story. I sold a camera to a guy that had no right arm once. Uh, and I know it sounds like a terrible joke, but it's not. It's true. <laughs> All right. And yes, um, so he he he, used the, hard, <laughs> he he held the camera in his left hand upside down and used the his thumb for the trigger. Oh, like that. Yes. See, I must admit, like. Tragic that people have disabilities, and by almost by no means are we putting any shit on anyone who has any disabilities. <laughs> yes. But like, you've got to admire how they adapt. Like, oh, it's brilliant. You know, here we are. I can I complain on when I got home from golf today. My wrist was a bit sore. I'm like, oh, gee, my wrist is a bit yeah, sore. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, but you know, at least I've got a wrist, and I can actually right. go and play golf. So these, you've got, yeah, you've got a wrist that can get sore. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, shout out to those who do it tough and just make us look. Um, you know, quite uh, pathetic when we carry on about things. Yeah, I also sold a camera to a blind guy. You did not. That is true. Right. Yeah, his guide dog in the shop and everything. It was fantastic. He wanted Petri. to take photos, so. Better he didn't see that coming. Wow. <laughs> did I thank everyone for subscribing and yeah. liking it? Well, look, look, our subscribers are going down. That's here. right. <laughs> No. Oh dear! Let's talk uh, about our backgrounds just to keep this before we yeah, drive this show completely into the ground tonight. I wonder how many complaints we're going to get over this one. No, people have a sense of humour. I'd like to uh, think we still have our senses senses of humour. Well, here's a here's a community notice for our subscribers and likers. If you don't have a sense of humour, please unsubscribe. <laughs> That's right. We don't want you. Here. <laughs> we don't want you. Here. Uh, you go first with your background, because okay, sure. Um, yeah. What do we do? Yes, that's right. Uh, this is. Um, this is Ocean Grove. It, it shows up quite yellow in this photo. The photo is not actually that yellow, but I don't know. It's right. bad, bad editing on my behalf more than anything. Uh, so this is um, it's called Raf's Beach, R-A-A-F, Raf's Beach. And it's uh, pretty much smack between Ocean Grove and Bowen Heads. Uh, we'll be quite close to this beach on Saturday and Sunday during the workshop. So... Uh, nice. And you can really only get this photo in winter when um, the bigger swells come in and the tide sort of pushes the sand up on the beach like that. And then the bigger swells come in and wash up around that old fence line there. I don't even know what that old fence line is. It, it might have been an old barrier to hold the sand in place, but like yeah. a groin, I think they call that. But I don't understand why it runs parallel to the beach instead of perpendicular. But anyway, um, yeah. Exposure time of about, I don't know, I want to say maybe half a second using an ND. Nice. Simple, very, really. Very nice good. and easy. And the RAF is uh, obviously RAAF as in Air Force. Yeah, beach. I think it gets its name from they used to do training there back during the wars. Uh, right. So yeah, it was right. Known, known as RAF's Beach. All the surfers know, know it as RAF's. Right, as they do. Mm. Uh, well, my background is, is that going to work? Yep. Um, this is on the way to the boat just yesterday yeah yesterday um on tuesday on the way up uh, through a place called pine lake it's got all these beautiful pencil pines it was foggy it was moody this is a two second walk from the from the car on a boardwalk so i thought i can't drive past that and not get some old gnarly pencil pine trees which are very cool they grow at certain altitudes they're very very old so that tree onto the the left of the frame there the bigger tree there is probably going to be pushing eight hundred thousand years old maybe as a tree Really? And, wow. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular. So um, we do have some very cool trees in Tassie. So, but um, that was a nice little happy snap as I made my way up to the boat. Tasmania is known for its trees. 
Yeah. Yeah, so we've got, got the, uh, So you've got that behind you, which yeah. is your pencil pine. You've got your Huon pine, which is world famous. Yeah. you get your Fagus, Correct. which is pretty much world famous as well. I'm sure, yeah. and there's probably some other, your Pandeni and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so we've got a lot of the Godwana uh, trees and yes. uh, Jurassic trees or whatever, Jurassic time trees. So, you know, the pencil pines, the King Billy pines, the Huon pines, the beautiful old myrtles, and then, like you said, the Fagus and the Pandenis. Uh, we also have beautiful Waratahs down here. We've got, um, if you're into photography, nature photography, which was mainly about the flora of a region, um, then this would be a pretty good project to come down and see. Plus, we've also got the world's tallest flowering gums, the, uh, the swamp gums. Amazing. Uh, we've got everything. So, yeah, it's really a, a time capsule down here for, mm. for the plant life, which is uh, makes for great photos, as, as you know. Yeah, incredibly um, diversive. I love it. Um, mm. Just a little bit, just to uh, talk a little bit about episode 81 uh, of the Down South Photo Show, just we, we, it stirred up as we knew it would, stirred up a lot of discussion and we had a bit of input from people who uh, wanted to voice their opinions about photographic competitions. I would just like to reiterate, the comments we made last week had nothing zero to do with the person that entered the winning photo in the competition it's 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 a fine photo there's Mm. nothing wrong with it there was 25 other photos that were better than it that (laughs) came after it so that's that was our point (laughs) just give it a kick give them a kick while they're down no 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 as i say nothing against no nothing there was nothing technically wrong with that photo it just wasn't the best photo that was entered that's all yeah, we did get some feedback and some comments, which is what you know what we're trying to generate here as well. We want to have some discussion around. We do. We want to have discussion. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there was a right or wrong answer as to what people do with their photo comps and whether or not people thought the photo comps they see are good or bad. You know, so be it. Um, I found it quite amusing that we got a lot of messages, even you know, anonymous phone calls to your store asking questions <laughs> about the episode and which competition we were talking about. Yes. Um, as we said off the bat, when we weren't going to say where it was, who it was, what it was, um, it was more about just bringing some awareness to what we sort of see as a bit of a trend happening with the photo competitions and what's going on. Um, yeah, so it was interesting. It's always interesting to talk about that. And people always, you know, they always sort of come back. They're either team yes or team no. So, yeah, it's good. It's good that we're discussing that. And, and yeah. hopefully, hopefully people now... Maybe when they're looking to enter competitions, you know, they might just look a little bit outside outside of the box a bit in the, as regards to what they're going to enter and how they're going to enter it. And yeah, I think it, it was educational and controversial at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And and I was talking to you today during our four and a bit hour production meeting that um that we had. <laughs> yeah, it was a good it was a good production meeting. Uh, it was. Uh, you you made some very valid points during the production meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I too come to life. <laughs> okay, that, that's enough of the in jokes. We'll let everyone in. Yes, Cam and I played golf together this morning, and that was our production meeting that went for four and yeah. a bit hours at Lonsdale Links. Yeah, before um, the rain, it's good. Yes, um, played with a, a lovely gentleman, Richard, who who was quite yeah. interested in what we did and mm. the, the show. I'm sure he's listening. G'day, Richard. Shout out to Richard. And uh, yeah, no, I was I mentioned to Cam that I discovered an, yet a, yet another photographic competition. I think it was by one of the out, outdoor stores, Anaconda or one of those. Who's the other one? Anyway, whatever. And they wanted some um, outdoor slash adventure photos and you enter it into their competition and if you get picked, you get in their magazine and you get in their calendar. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Was, as usual, I'll read the terms and conditions, got all the way through and right at the end, $19 per entry, please. Yeah, that, that's pretty rich for an entry price for a competition. Well, it's only, it's only nineteen dollars, but that's not the point. I think one dollar is too much. Any yeah, money, I, no money should change hands when all they're going to do is use your photos for their advertising. Yeah, and this is where I, I get a be in a bonnet about it is that over the last five ten years, people what we've we've become our own worst enemy because we put all these photos out there, we share them online, we enter competitions. And then these companies pick them up and use them, or they, you know, they make you pay for the competition, and but the terms and conditions say they'll use them on the front cover or whatever it is. And then we sit there and piss and moan that people are taking our photos, and oh, is not we can't sell any photos anymore, we can't make money, mm. you know, you can't have 
your cake and eat it. You either say, no, I'm not, not I'm not entering these competitions because you're going to use my images for this, or you do, and you, you accept the the consequences of what happens to your images afterwards. So, yeah. but yeah, um, like I think I think we spoke about this on a previous episode as well about entry prices to competitions, and some of them some of them are free, and then some of them charge. And yeah, again, it's up to the individual whether or not they want to. You know, maybe the one that we were talking about last week that that image that won and has done well in other competitions, and maybe they'll pay twenty dollars to enter and yeah, have a good chance of winning again. Yeah, and and I think I heard everyone just yell out all at once. Well, Brendan, if you don't want to pay it, don't enter the competition. And you're right. Yeah, that's exactly that's, not that's right. That's exactly what I'm not going to do. Um, we're going to talk about some printing this week, Cam. Yeah, seems that's exactly. what we teased our audience with last week. Uh, I think we teased them about three weeks ago, but that's okay. <laughs> that's right. Um, it sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we we said it. Oh, well, next week we'll do this, and then we went on to something else. Um, yeah. Now this one won't be this one won't be a rant, I don't think. So it's probably not going to rate really well on the charts. Or no, it's going to be some um, it's going to be some information about okay. um, about printing photos because, of course, doing what I do, um, I, I I print photos all day, um, yeah, every day. It's 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 my thing. Uh, sometimes I print little six by four photos. Sometimes I print gigantic canvas prints, of which I've got two sitting in my office right now, by yeah. a very talented and world famous Tasmanian-based landscape photographer. Not that TP guy. Uh, no, not 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 toilet paper. Someone else. Um, <laughs> I already know where this is going because every episode now TP is going to have a different meaning. True. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Tent pole. Ed Paul, <laughs> total <laughs> prick. <No. Yeah. laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we made the bold claim many, many episodes ago. Well, I did. I don't know whether you backed that up, but I made the bold claim that a photograph is not a photograph until it's printed. Yep. And although in this modern era, that's probably, it's getting harder and harder for that to hold water because of the mediums in which we view our photos. So computer screens, phone being the biggest one, um, you know, monitors rather than actually having them printed. And, of course, I have a vested interest because I do it for a living. But um, I still do believe photos are made to be printed. Um, yeah. And I actually believe the technology that goes into cameras uh, always is grounded in the printed image by the time you get, you know, image resolution and, and 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 color calibration and all that sort of stuff that generally all always is anchored in the printing in the print medium so um to give to give you a good example now the, the two photos that i printed here for you i'm talking about cameron the two the yep. two that i printed for you yeah, yeah i thought they were great photos honestly like I, and i'm not blowing smoke they are great photos the two that i printed it wasn't until i actually printed them and then stretch them onto canvas and put them on the stretcher bar yeah. and then went them up against my wall and went, holy smokes, these are actually really good photos. And um, yeah, yeah. The, there's, the, something, there's something about a print, isn't there, though? That's, there is. It's tactile. Yeah. It stirs something else. It's more than looking at a monitor, um, particularly, and I'm a huge fan of textured surfaces, so canvas, uh, cotton rag papers. I much prefer to print on those over smooth you know, like you know, gloss or a, or, a, or a luster pearl finish mm. and that sort of stuff yeah yeah um but yeah with the canvas prints in particular that there's a certain luminosity about them and i really really enjoy it and and of course i did these things quite big and that's i think that's probably the clincher is if you're going to yeah. print I, mean, I do a lot of canvases like small canvas prints you know a4 like they're so boring like i love doing bigger canvases like you made, 20 you made by about 30. That size. About that yeah, size. Yeah, exactly. Let me get a ruler. <laughs> Twenty by thirty inches um, yeah. to begin with is, is yeah. I think, your starting your base starting point. If you've got a good good landscape photo, don't waste it on a small print. Get something no. printed decent. Um, yeah. You know, I may, maybe at a pinch, if I had to say, a three would be okay. A two is better. Um, Twenty by thirty inches, that sort of stuff. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a massive, massive fan of the printed image and I still get a big buzz, obviously, when I see my own stuff, but probably these days even more so when I see another photographer's work come to life, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and I agree 100% is that it's not until, and I think one of the things I love about 
putting prints or printing prints or putting them in a frame or whatever it might be, even just printing off my little A2 printer at home, is just sometimes the detail that you just don't see on a screen. Like most yeah. of us look at a picture these days on one of these things. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we don't really see, you see a picture and you go, oh, that looks aesthetically okay and you know, pretty and there's nice colours. But when you get a print and a big print, like you said, A3 or A2, you see all the, you know, for example, the moss on the rocks behind me here and you see all the yeah. bark detail and all that kind of stuff. You don't get that on a screen. You, you might see it when you're editing it, but the photo is not for you to see to view and enjoy as such it's it's for the person that you want to share it to or the world you want to share it to so i would have thought that printing stuff out would be probably the ultimate game because people can actually really look at the detail that we see with our own eyes uh, and i'm sure it happens where you take a photo and you say oh i love this little bit you know in the back of the photo whatever it might be and you know it's there because you're editing it that's great and you see it there and then you put it on a little screen and no one sees it yeah. And the whole, the whole, the whole magic of that shot might be lost because people don't see it. It's not until you print it out to a decent size, or people see it on a bigger display, which is rare, um, yeah. that you they sort of see the real full value of the, of the artist and the shot they've taken. And there's a classic example I try and do um, with a lot of my shots. I always try and do what's called little Easter eggs. So I always try and put something in my shot that's away from the main topic, but might catch someone's eye. Sometimes it's like a crescent moon, or it might be a little leaf or it might be a bit of this, and you don't pick that up as much on on a screen, but when you print it out, um, people go, oh, wow, hey, that's cool. I didn't see that bit before. Yeah. And I think that's what – and getting back to what you said, you know, I think a lot of the cameras are uh, definitely weighted in the printing medium. Um, and, you know, you've, you've got to, you go back to, like, the legends like Ansel Adams. He did books on how to print you know, Peter Dombrowskis printed, Ken Duncan prints, Steve Parrish prints, Peter Eastway prints. Like they all used to or still print heavily, um, which, you know, really should be the ultimate game for people. And I know I've been driving at home in my workshops with customers. Hey, you know what? Give me, send me a file and I'll print it out for you. Um, mm. and I'm actually going to start doing that on some of my workshops. I'm going to put a little gift pack together and actually give someone like an A3 print rolled up of their work or my work, whatever it might be, just so they can roll it out and have a look at it and feel it and say, wow, that looks really great. Look at that detail. Yeah. And I think it's that's what we should be aiming for. No, I, I completely agree. And and I'm, I'm the same. I, I wanted to, you know, as an example, run like a workshop for someone, but at the end of it, they end up with the canvas print on their wall. You know, and I think that'd be Perfect. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this might be something we get into down the track. Um, so well, when it comes to printing, um, yeah. You, you pose a question, what, what's the most important thing about printing? Well, there's not one exact, you know, one thing that's more important than another. It's 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 a it's a concoction of a lot of things. One thing to remember straight out of the gate is what size you do want to print to and what convention you want to use. Now, do you want to print in A sizes? Do you want to use millimeters? Do you want to use inches? Now, this can sometimes be determined whether or not you want to frame your artwork. Uh, or whether you've got a specific spot on the wall for it. So what I uh, come up against a lot is people that, you know, interest rates have just gone up again. People are tight yeah. tightening their belts. People are looking yeah. to save a few bucks. So people will go and buy cheaper frames, which is fine. If that suits your budget and, and you get a frame that looks good that and, and, and you're happy to spend that money. The problem normally is they buy them in A sizes. So they'll be... Yeah. Yeah. an A3, an A2, or an A1, fine. The issue comes, though, is what part of your photo are you going to crop out? That's right. Because yeah, that's, yeah. Our sensors are not set to A sizes. They're set to photographic sizes, photographic ratios, mm -hmm. namely two to three Jeez. or three to four. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, th I think that's – I've fallen in that trap a few times as well where I've bought frames – and I'm like, oh, cool, that's an A4 frame, but I've got 8x12 paper or 8x10 paper or that's vice right. versa. And you're like, okay, one, one, it doesn't fit the frame snug because it's the wrong, like I said, the wrong ratio. And then two, you know, where am I cropping? You know, you, I, 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 ideally you don't want to be cropping anything off your photo if you don't have to. That's right. But, yeah, so so you're saying that the first thing people really should look at is, is where they're going to put the photo and what size is they going to work in, whether or not it's centimetres or inches. Yep. Um, or A or, sizes. Yeah. Yeah. So could you could people if people did want to go out and buy cheap frames, yeah, and they then shoot to that ratio, would you like if they went well, out and bought like 
you know, yeah, alcohol course. is Yeah. Well, that, that, that's one way it can be done. But, of course, the other way is to edit your photo suitably. So you can, you know, you, you might have a photo that, you've, that you took five years ago. You never thought about framing it, but now all of a sudden you want to frame it. Yeah. Then yeah. it's a matter of putting your, your image into your um, editing software, whatever you're using. Every piece of image software from buddy Microsoft Paint to full-blown Photoshop has a crop tool. Yeah, and you can I set do. the crop tool to the right ratio that you need to crop to. And some of them are even break it right down. They'll even say A3. Great. Perfect. Yeah, right. Okay. So I'm going to print to A3. What a lot of people don't realize with frames as well, if a frame, particularly a frame that comes with a pre-cut mat board, if it says it's A3, it means it's A3 plus just a little bit extra to cover the artwork. People get confused by that. They think that I've got to print it A3 plus that extra couple right. of mil. No, I don't. Oh, right, yeah. I, yeah, if okay. it says A3 on the frame, it means they've made it A3 with a very slight overlap on that mat board so that it'll hold your photo properly. Otherwise, um, it just falls through the hole. Correct. So, yeah, um, yeah th there's always confusion about that. But, but as a rule of thumb, you can be assured that whatever it says on the frame is the, the size you need to print your artwork to. Okay. Moving away from framing and sizing, yep. if if we go back to the start, of, because that's sort of the end of the process, if we go yes. back to the start of the process, if you're shooting a scene um, yep. as, a, as a professional printer, what are, the, what are the top three things that you see that people don't do correctly, I guess, in camera? So whether or not it's, um, you know, lack of focus or it's, uh, you know, a different sharpness or, you know, filter, filter vignette, whatever it is what are the what are the things that you see most on people's images that you go you know what you could have probably fixed that at the time of photo oh well, well then... the, fir the first thing is is your, is your basic composition but also yep. when it comes to important parts of your composition being quite close to the edges um okay. that that creates a problem straight away with printing because you're you're going to crop part of the image or when you, if you want to make it a canvas print and it's going to wrap around the edge, you're going to lose part of the, the edge. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's a different technique that we use, which I'll come back to later when we're talking canvases. But I see that a lot where, um, particularly when, because I, you know, I print a lot of uh, like family reunion photos and it's a big group of people and they've got, in fact, quite often it's a professional photographer has come in and they will put, you know, heads right, right on the exact extremes of the photo. Give me some room, please. <laughs> just, yeah. I'm not talking about much. I'm just talking about 5% more just to, yeah. so I've got margins to play in when we do have to crop your photo to suit the cheap frame that you bought or to suit the particular frame that you bought. So I think number one yeah. is definitely giving thought to the person printing your photo and giving them margins to play in. I think that's really yeah. important. I've been having this chat with his friend, uh, Jamie. Um, we just did the Bruni Island workshop together and he came back and he had some photos that he had edited from a similar thing behind you on a beach. And he goes, what do you think of these, Cam? And straight away, I'm like, oh, one, two, three. There was these three points all touching the outside of the frame. Yep. And he's like, oh, I didn't even notice them. And I'm like, yeah, just, just give things room to breathe. So even if you're not printing, a really good tip is, to, and I do it all the time, is I always scan the outside of my frame. So here I scan the outside of my frame Yep. And one thing that annoys me on my shot here at the background is, where are we over here, is that tree is actually going into the top of the frame. There's actually, I could have put a bit of gap in there, but I would have lost the ratio and would have squeezed yep. the size in a bit more. So, yeah, real hot, red hot tip for me is if you're taking, especially a landscape shot, before you take the shot or even after you take the first one, just scan around the outside of the frame and see what's going to annoy Brendan <laughs> and when he goes printing. If something is going to be touching... You know, you can see here on this side, I've got a bit of gap between that tree and the frame. And same on the other side here, I've got a bit of gap. And that's, that's done purposely to give the subject a bit of room to breathe. So yeah. it works both ways. Yeah, definitely. And the second thing that I'll point out, and this actually happened today to a, a customer, and you might think it's a bit weird to bring this up, but ISO. So quite often, um, particularly if you're a beginner or you're an amateur photographer, you'll quite often be tempted to leave your camera in auto ISO mode. Now, what can generally happen there is when you start operating in lower and lower light, the camera will automatic, and if you're just shooting in program or auto modes, the camera will boost its ISO um, without, you, without you doing anything. It does it automatically. It just boosts the ISO. 
And on your little LCD screen on the back of the camera, and even on your phone screen, or in some cases your laptop screen, you don't notice just how noisy that image or grainy that image is until you bring it into me and you say, I need an A1 print of this. Yeah. And yeah. the first thing I do, so if ever I'm printing those sort of sizes with the customer right in front of me is I will open it in Photoshop and I'll enlarge it to actual size on my screen because my screen is calibrated to my printer so that people can see exactly what they're going to see in the print. Now, again, it's all about correct viewing distance. So they're not, the viewer's not necessarily going to be going right up to it close and, oh, geez, look, I can see that's quite grainy. I make yeah. sure that the customer knows that it's there so that when yeah. they pick up their print, they don't go, oh, I didn't, you could have told me it was grainy or I didn't realize it doesn't look very good because it's so grainy. That's because you've made it literally 40 times bigger than your phone screen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Watch your eye. So if you know, you're going to want to print big. And there's, there's something you can do to help that. And, and you're right. A lot of people do go straight into auto ISO and which is fine. A lot of the newer cameras can handle that. But like you said, if you start printing big, yeah. you're going to start noticing that. But one thing you can do on a lot of cameras these days is actually put an upper limit on your ISO. So, you know, if you let the camera go auto, it might go from 100 to 125,000 ISO. Yep. Well, if you are in a darker situation, the camera is always going to push that high ISO to match the shutter speed so there's no camera shake. But you can actually limit that top end and the bottom end if you want to. But you can limit the top end so you don't blow the ISO too high and get noise, yep. as you just as you noticed. Um, we'll probably capture this later on in, in the bit about the paper that we're going to talk about, but you would certainly see different noises on different papers, you know. Oh, 100%. Canvas, canvas would probably swallow a lot of noise versus, you know, a nice smooth luster or something or a smooth gloss or whatever yes, it might be. So exactly. we'll get onto that. Um, have you got another one in camera that you're thinking? Yeah, well, and and we, that's the one that we banged on about a few weeks ago and, and that is sharpness of the image. And that, that marries up a little bit with the ISO issue as well is, you know, um, sometimes it's, it is important to pixel peep to have a bit of a look, zoom in on your screen and check your sharpness. Um, and normally for me, if I'm in the field, it happens after I've taken the shot. So I'll take the photo. And you you know the feeling, Cam, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do. You know you've got something. It's like, now that that's that's working for me. That's a good shot. The first thing I do is zoom in on it. And it's like, okay, that I'm still here. The scene is still there. This is my chance to check and make sure I got, yes. did I nail that focus? Did I get that right? Could I have changed the aperture setting so I get a bit more depth, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's a, an unbelievably good, important point. Um, pro tip. And that's, pro, that's an extra pro tip. And I think um, what people need to get their head around, if you really want to improve your photography, like if you're just a happy snapper and you don't care, go for it, knock yourself out. But if you're wanting to get you know, a better level of photography and output and professionalism, shoot like you're shooting film pretend that each frame of that digital camera even if you got five thousand shots on your memory card treat each frame as if it's a as if it's a roll of film or a, a one single negative because you if you're shooting film you used to do all that naturally That's you right. check everything before i press this button again for another five dollars is it going to be working so <laughs> make sure yeah check your sharpness check your aperture check your composition um, I also check the highlights and make sure I'm not blowing any highlights in my files and stuff like that. Like I and that can in this photo right here. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, but it's something that you can simply do. And if you get in the habit of it, it's two seconds after each shot. You just go, yep, 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 tick, 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 they're done. I'm good yep. to go. So, yeah, it's really important that you just check all those important details of the shot before you take it to you and drop a couple hundred bucks on a really nice print and a frame. Which, which and get is an added... Yeah. It's an added bonus of using a tripod, isn't it? Because, you know, you've got your camera locked off on a tripod. You've got your composition right, but you might have stuffed up and blown highlights in a certain area. Well, you can make your yeah. corrections without moving the camera. Everything is That's framed right. up exactly where you left it. Exactly. Um, which I which I guess I took for granted until just then. I just thought about it and went, yeah, actually, yeah, that is a, that is a real plus of having a, yeah. having a tripod. Totally, and I, I shared something with you last night. Someone asking about a tripod. That's right. In um, in a in a Facebook group, and they said they wanted to use all these real heavy, heavy lenses to do a lot of all different types of um, applications of photography. And I said, you know, based on all that, yeah, your lightweight tripod that you're looking for is not going to be sturdy enough for carrying the weight of the gear you've got. You're going to introduce probably more problems than fixing problems. So yeah, using a tripod when you can is going to help a lot of different things. Like you said. It'll keep that frame the same, 
but it also helps with sharpness and everything else that goes with it. So, yeah, cool. All right. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot to be said for getting getting it right in the field. Yeah, when, you, when totally. you're starting. Uh, to me, I reckon it's ninety percent of the ninety percent of the work. Yeah. Now, if you can get something really good in camera, and then you edit it, and then you print it, it all just gels in like an it's like a really good song composition it all goes together it comes out at the end sounding sounding and looking really good and you know you've created a bit of art so um so if we go, if we go from the camera to the next step because there's three steps there's the, the shoot the, the shooting the, the developing or editing and then the printing yeah when, when you're in your editing what are the is it some sort of highlights that stand out for you that what people do wrong or maybe can yeah. change and, when they're editing? and number one by far is monitor calibration so yeah. so people get a little bit hung up on calibration um it all it seems really complicated when in actual fact it's purely not mm -hmm. you've just got to look at it as uh, a baseline so if i if i've got a screen i'm looking at a computer screen now cam you're looking at one i've got my phone screen here i've got 17 different monitors at work now when when monitors are brand new the colors on them are generally pretty accurate over time i'm sorry that that that's a very very broad statement and not completely true because some monitors are crap but yeah. <laughs> as but a they're, general they're, rule of thumb they're at they're at a factory standard they're, at, the they're at a factory standard and when we say calibrate it's not like every monitor gets calibrated differently every monitor gets calibrated the same yeah. that's my point and a lot of people don't realize that that when we talk about monitor calibration I want your monitor at home to look like my monitor at work to look like this monitor I'm looking at now. And monitor calibration can be uh, is, it can be quite simple. Unfortunately, you need a tool to do it, um, yeah. like a monitor calibrator. Now, I'm 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 lazy as I I don't calibrate anywhere near as much as I should. However, the monitor that well the main monitor that I print from in my shop is is a good expensive monitor that holds its color quite well. So. Yeah. Um, you can you can turn your monitor off and then turn it on again, and it might be slightly different in terms of color. Yeah, you can yeah. also be looking at your monitor in the daytime and then looking at it in nighttime, and that can make a difference as well. It's really important if you want to get into printing regularly to have the similar environment that you're viewing your images, so a similar light source every time. Uh, that's why you can see some quite expensive monitors like the ESO monitors and this sort of stuff. They have the big black box that comes off the side of the monitor. That's to cut down that ambient light that's striking the panel so that's that right. it's not giving you a color cast. Yeah. So monitor calibration doesn't have to be difficult. You can get very, very basic monitor calibrators like your color monkey and these things, which are, I look from memory, about a hundred bucks. Um, and they, they're great. You just, you basically just suspend a little, little um contraption over the over your screen and it yeah, puts a right. white box on your screen and it reads it and then it basically changes the settings on your monitor so you're running that's software right. that actually changes the settings on your monitor to calibrate it so yeah that's right. um, yeah. yeah it's it's it is it, it's it's not as complicated as people think no i think i think before i sort of got into printing a few years ago that was the one thing that i sort of just went, oh, that sounds a bit tricky. You know, maybe I'll just, you know, go try it and see how I go. And I, I had that many issues. You know, I'd get a beautiful coloured shot and I'd print it. It'd be like, oh, let's go. It's okay, but it's it's not where I want it to be. But then I started yeah. calibrating all my monitors. Um, I use the Spider color yeah. monitors. They're really good as well. I was just thinking, you know, as you were talking then about people that may listen to it. And, you know, those color monitor calibration tools, they're maybe 150 bucks, maybe 200 bucks or whatever they might be. They might be cheaper. But I was just thinking that, you know, again, interest rates going up, people are, you know, cutting cutting everything back a bit. But if you're in a camera club or have a really good group of friends that are all photographers, just go buy a monitor between your group or your or your camera club and just share it around because it's it's portable. They go, they're only they're only a calibrator, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're only tiny. So, you know, if you're in a camera club and you want to make sure, you know, your printing calibration of your monitor is good then buy one for the club and keep it in the club and then people can just take it home and calibrate their monitor or bring their laptop into the club rooms or whatever it might be. Or, yeah. you know, if you've got a handful of mates that all do photography, just go chip in and buy one together because yeah. it'll save you massive headaches later on when you're sort of editing and then printing. Yeah. Uh, and the money you having, spend on, 
greater. You'll probably having, say that. Having said all this, though, don't get too hung up on colour. A lot of people... So, I, I again, I print for the masses and, um, you know, I print for a lot of very... I print for a lot of pros as well. I print for um, quite a few uh, school photographers and kindergarten photographers and this sort of stuff. And I just tell them to calibrate their monitor. You know, and they get it. They understand that. That's fine. I do occasionally get people in who will look at an image on my screen and then look at the canvas print I've done for them and they'll notice a 2 to 3% variance in colour. Right. The photo still looks amazing. Um, I, I don't, it's very, it's very, very hard to deliver perfection in color. You, there is always going to be some kind of tolerance. Now, whether that comes down to screen calibration or whether it comes down to the material that you're printing to, or the printer hasn't, there is a difference between calibrating a monitor and then actually calibrating your printer. And they are two different things as well. Uh, and professional print labs calibrate their printers very, very regularly, like every few months, because it can change a lot. So I can order a roll of canvas from Ilford, for example, and I order my, it comes in in January and it looks fantastic. And then I order exactly the same canvas in June and it comes in and it's slightly different. It's, yeah, it's okay. actually, and, and again, we're talking small percentages here. Don't get too hung up on it. Don't, don't look at a cut oh, of that. Some people say, oh, that that looks different to my screen, therefore I don't like it. They don't actually take a step back and go, actually, it still looks totally fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, and look, I'm happy to reprint stuff for people, but quite often it'll be a case of, well, hang on a minute, let's just have a look at this and make sure that you are actually unhappy with it. And, yeah, and sometimes it's blatantly obvious that there's been some mistake somewhere, and I understand that. But quite often it's that subtle that, it's like, actually, you know what? This one's probably better. <laughs> and that happens yeah. a lot too. So you just, yeah. yeah, as I say, don't get too hung up on the color science of it. Um, but as long as you're within that, I want to say three to 4%, you should be you should be satisfied with that result from a good quality printing lab. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And if, you, if you're not getting the results you want from a proper lab, um, then you might need to look elsewhere. Yeah. yeah, well, but, I mean, if, you, if you're going through Snapfish and spending 19 well, cents for an A4. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Like, I, I would highly, highly recommend people don't print through places like Harvey Norman, Kmart, oh, even Kodak Express stores, all those, you know, yeah. those smaller labs. Um, print with someone who, like you said, prints on a daily basis and prints all different types of materials, canvases, yeah. sizes, yeah. the whole lot, because... Um, the ones that do the Harvey Norman and the Snapfish and all those kind of stuff, they are just worthless. Those places drive pro photographers insane yep. because, you know, you, you pay a photographer thousands of dollars to shoot your wedding and then you go and print them at Harvey Norman. Yeah. You know, and, and it's it's just, oh, it's like running a Ferrari on regular fuel or whatever, you know, it's it's just yeah. Tirana hubcaps on a Lamborghini. And, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And the thing that really annoys me about that as well is if you do a wedding and most of the time when I did weddings, it's like, well, if you do want to get prints done, let me print them. I'll, I'll charge you the cost of what they are. I'm not going to make any money on it, but let yeah. me print them. Yeah. And they go, they go to Harvey Norman or something like that and get them printed and come back, oh, they're okay. The color's a bit wishy-washy. And that, that reflects on you as the photographer. You, but you, you're like, well, it's got nothing to do with me. Yeah. So the people looking at those photos, if the photos yeah. look no good, are they going to say who printed these? No way. No, They're going to say who these. took these photos. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so look after your photographer yeah. people and get yeah. them, pay a few extra bucks and get them printed somewhere good. Hard enough as it is. All right. Um, would you have any recommendations on printer choice? So if people are listening, they're like, you know what? I'm going to start printing some stuff. Yep. I'm going to yep. go buy a $99 printer, inkjet printer from Officeworks to do <laughs> A4 prints. Would you say that's a good idea? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, look, there, there's some there's some okay printers out there. I'll tell you the big problem with printers, particularly inkjet, is people will get into the idea of wanting to do it, and that's great, and they'll buy it, and they get all excited, and then they realize that nothing's calibrated, the colors aren't right, it's not coming out how they thought it would come out, even though you're following the instructions to the absolute letter. 
then they get a bit frustrated. Then the printer sits there for three months and they go to use it again and all the heads are clogged because they're not using it. Yep. Um, printers need to be used every day. If yep. you're not going to print every day, I would seriously think about using a lab to print for you. Um, it, and I've seen it in my printers. I've got, um, you know, my, my big, you've seen my big Naritsu printer, which is, you yes. know, a $75,000 machine. Um, if it sits for more than two or three days, I've got to run, you know, nozzle cleans and head checks and all this sort of stuff to get it back. Yeah. But if it prints on the regular, it never skips a beat. So, well, yeah, I think um, that's something that people, again, we're talking about sort of the printing side of things. It's another f- part of the art form. Like it's, yeah. it's not like take all this time to take a photo, take all this time to edit, press a button, print. It, it's not like that. The printing is a process as well where you need to take care of your equipment. Like you said, you need to print regularly. If you're not, you need to do the, the nozzle checks and the print tests and stuff like that mm-hmm. because there's ink does different things, different printer heads or all these different things you need to take care of. So, yeah, I agree. If you're not, if you're looking to print stuff, Look, I, I probably like in my experience, I push it out maybe a little bit more. In my experience, if I don't print something every week or two, then I'll do a full nozzle check the whole thing on mine. But I find that my Epson printer that I've got, um, I think it's a P eight hundred. I think it is. It is um, yeah. that, that seems to go well. You know, within a week or so of using it, um, I cranked it up the other day for the first time in about a month. And straight away I did a nozzle check and it, it showed the little pattern that it does and yep. it showed all these gaps and I had to do a clean. So if you are going to do printing, which again, this is what this is all about. This episode is people should be out printing. If you're going to look at doing it at home, then you need to be looking at regularly printing stuff. And the way I've got around that issue of letting my printer stay dormant is if I come back from a shoot or I've got some images, I'm all, I've got a, I've got boxes of prints. So I'm just printing really nice shots I like out and storing them carefully back in boxes so that I can put them in frames later or whatever, but it also keeps my printer ticking over as well. Yep, for sure. And of course, then then comes the costs involved with having your own printer as well. Um, and I don't know whether I've mentioned this on the show before, but I would say printer ink is one of the most expensive liquids in the world. It's unreal, isn't it? It's it, it's phenomenal. Like we complain about the cost of fuel at hitting two dollars a liter, yeah. folks. If you could fill up your petrol tank with printer ink, and I'm not making this up, it will cost about eighty five thousand dollars to fill yeah. your petrol tank with printer ink. Um, yeah. It's it's just absolutely highway robbery what these companies charge for home printer inks. You know, oh, here, buy a printer, it's $80. But every time yeah. you have to refill it, it's $129. Yeah. Um, you know, and then it's going to clog. And then, oh, the printer, you know, it's just, it's, it's outrageous what people, what they're charging for printer ink for home style printers. Yeah. And then um, they, they still, um, they still, you know, tell you that you need to use their, their branded <laughs> ink. Don't buy aftermarket ink. Yeah. Um, you know, do this or do that, or you know, make sure it's the Epson ink. Don't buy this one or don't buy yeah. that one. So you, you're locked into buying it. I'm just looking at prices here, right? So I'm just going on. For example, I'm doing K a KL Australia's ink. Uh, yeah. with Dinger. It is uh, one dollar eighteen per milliliter. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's ninety five dollars for an eighty mil tank. Yeah, the eighty milliliter tank. Milliliters. So, <laughs> what's that? you times that by a hundred. It's, it's ridiculous how it's, expensive. Is it a hundred? Uh, no, it's is it a hundred millimeters or a thousand milliliters for a liter? It's a thousand. thousand. For a so liter. A, a liter of this is black ink yep. is eleven hundred and eighty six dollars. There you go. Average tank of a car eighty liters. <laughs> Seventy-seven thousand dollars, one hundred and thirty-eight dollars, and that's yeah. just black. <laughs> yeah, that's just black. That's not the color. Uh, but getting back to your question about what uh, <laughs> brand printers, um, Epson is all I've ever used. Yeah. So I'm probably a little bit biased towards them. Um, they don't skip a beat. So yeah. I've got a printer in my shop at the moment that you helped me lift into the shop, Cameron. You might remember that about five oh, years ago. That is still killing me about that. Yeah. Uh, it's my 44-inch printer. 
Uh, it's a beast and I absolutely love it. It is, it's yeah. been an absolute workhorse, that thing. It owes me nothing. Yeah. Um, and the color accuracy, uh, it's an eight ink system. So um, it has um, the light, light cyan, light magenta, yeah. um, light, light black, light, light black and photo black. So as well as CMYK. So it's, um, as well as CMY, it's 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 awesome. It's a it's a cool printer. So, yeah, as I say, oh, Canon make fantastic printers. Um, HP, I don't think I don't even know if they exist anymore, but definitely yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. the big printer, the Naritsu printer, I use that prints all my everything from six by four up to a uh, twelve by eighteen inch enlargement. Uh, yeah. They use Epson printhead technology, so I guess yeah. that's why I, I like it because I, I get I get consistent results. Right. Um, keep being conscious of time. Um, quick, uh, I think paper choice is just the last thing we're going to touch on. That that can be, that can be quite vague or quite broad in regards to yeah. what we want. But you can sort of go canvas, or you can go rag, or you can go yeah. luster or gloss, yeah. acrylic, whatever it might be. Um, I guess, do you recommend the people when they come in and say, oh, "I reckon this will look good on canvas. I reckon this might look good on this." Yeah, yeah I do. Uh, and the, the, so where I always go back to where they're going to hang it. All right, so yeah. you know, if people come in, oh, I'd li I'd like to see this as a canvas. Oh, you know, I want this. First of all, they say I want a big print of this. Normally, they've come in in their mind that they're going to get it printed on photo paper and they're going to go and get it framed. Yeah, not a lot of people think about canvas. I think canvas has sort of had its day in the sun as a bit of a trend. However, canvas can really suit a particular area, particularly a well lit area. If you get a lot of natural daylight, well, do you want to see? A lot of glass and reflection or do you want to see the image yeah. um yes you can get non-reflective glass i hate the stuff it gives a color cast you can get yes. art glass which is low reflection maintains color gives a bit of a gloss looks fantastic it's really expensive it's about 300 dollars for an a a1 sheet so yeah. you know it's yeah. it, you got to weigh all that up so um when it comes to paper choices it's horses for courses as to where it's going to go i think right now um the 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 smooth smooth and textured cotton rag papers are really popular. Yep. They look fantastic behind glass as well. But again, normal glass completely kills the textured surface. It takes it it goes back to being glass again or go back goes back to being a gloss finish again. Yeah, that's right. So, I would much see uh the rag papers behind art glass and again you'll pay a lot for it or don't forget about canvas because, again, canvas has – it's lightweight, it's easy to hang, it has no glare or reflection. Um, they're easy to clean. You just literally dust them down, wipe them with a slightly damp cloth, they'll be totally fine. Yeah, um, yeah no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big – as you know, Cam, I'm a big rap for canvas. Does canvas have the same archival properties to it as, for example, some so, of the higher papers? Uh, it can have if it's treated correctly. So, and if you use a proper pre-primed photographic canvas, so your bigger brands like Hanna Mueller, um, Ilford, uh, Canson, these guys, they will have proper, uh, properly primed canvas, if you like, that's ready yeah. to to take the ink and absorb the ink into the surface of the texture. Cheap canvases you'll find through companies like Snapfish, Harvey Norman, these kind of places. They look okay when you get them. In about six months, you'll start to see things happening, a little bit of peeling here or there, colors yeah, okay. starting to change, that sort of stuff. So yeah. we use, with the Epson system, we use what's called Chroma Life K3 inks. It's a pigment ink. It actually actually gets absorbed by the canvas or the paper uh, oh. and dries instantly. So um, it sort of locks it in there if you like. Now, if you use archival quality, archival paper, mm -hmm. Even if you use the standard Ilford papers, for example, um, with Chroma Life K3 inks, they say it's guaranteed for 75 years. Now, that's pretty much anyone's lifetime, if you like. Um, of course, you can get archival paper that will last 300 years. Interesting <laughs> selling point. I'm not sure why, but sometimes yeah. you might want, you know, if it's a really important photo to you and you think it might be a family heirloom, that sort of stuff, I understand yeah. that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, generally speaking, you know, our stuff's color fast for seventy-five years, so yeah. which I think is pretty good. That's before it yeah. starts to change. 
Yeah, and that's right. That's yeah. probably like it's half life, if you like. <laughs> by then, by then your eyes are knackered anyway. You can't see the difference anyway. <laughs> that's right. But in seventy five <laughs> yeah. years, we'll be living to seven hundred. So you know. Well, that's right. In seventy five years, um, we'll probably be using the Apple Vision Pro glasses to yes look at all right here. Can I just make one more point about printing before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that is, uh, the, and this catches a lot of people out, and this is the prepping of your image for printing. Now, you can you can bring an image in to me um, if you want to come in face to face, and I'll do all this stuff for you. But if you want to email it in or send it online to a printing company, um, it's it's quite important that you uh, export it correctly. So in Lightroom or Photoshop, you you can export your image. And now in I believe in Lightroom, there's an export to print option, which will then open a dialog box, which will give you all the parameters you can change. Please send your artwork at a minimum of 300 dots per inch, ideally already correctly sized, so that I'm not so that me or the person at the other end is not re resizing it because resizing it quite often can lead to a change of um, of uh, image quality uh, in terms of resolution. So if you, you might have it set at 300 dots per inch, but your export size is only 100 mil by 100 mil, whereas you actually want to get a print that's 1,000 mil by 1,000 mil. So yeah. this is all really important stuff. A JPEG file is totally fine. You will in my opinion, get the best result from a TIFF file. However, TIFF files are big. So quite often with a TIFF file, you've physically got to chuck it onto a USB or at very, very worst, Dropbox it yeah. um, to get the best result if you, if, you, if, if you want to send a TIFF. A JPEG is totally fine. If you're, even if you're printing quite large, a JPEG is totally fine. Yes, it's a lossy file, which means all the data is not there. But generally speaking, again, with a print at correct viewing distance, JPEGs are totally fine. So don't get too hung up on having to send through TIFF files. In fact, a lot of online ordering systems for printing won't accept a TIFF file because it's normally too bloody big. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so ideally, TIFF or JPEG, 300 dots per inch and sized correctly so that I'm not having to choose what part of the image to crop because yeah. that should be up to the photographer. Yeah. So if anyone's keen to know more about that, there's there'd be a plethora of online tutorials about how to size your image for printing. Yes. Um yes. it's quite a, it's it's not a complex part of it, but it, it's an important part, which yeah. probably we can't cover in ten minutes of a podcast. No, you probably need no. to go and have a look because but once the thing is once you get that done, then once you've done one setup and export it, then you're good. You know, you know how to do it going forward. So exactly. Um, it's just a habit forming. Yeah. Um, so I reckon that's covered all our printing questions or that I wanted to talk about with you. <laughs> if um, you have a question. Yeah. And if you do, uh, I'd love to see people put in the comments about whether or not they do print or if it's something they're interested in printing or whether or not it's just like, oh, hands in the air too hard, don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear what people are doing because I think we can, we're such a great little community. We've got 551 subs. I yep. reckon we can always start a movement for people starting to print stuff more. Don't chuck it online to Instagram or that kind of crappy stuff. Maybe print it out and uh, start doing stuff with your photography. There's nothing better than having your own artwork up on your own walls at home. Yeah, I can't wait to get these big ones. Hopefully they fit in my car. But uh, Well, this I'm, I keep looking at them. They're right here. Right. <laughs> They're like literally off camera. <laughs> yeah, right. Um did you want to hold off gear talk to next week? Because we've got yes. almost an hour. What do you we, yeah. we, are, we are getting close to time. Um, send in your photography horror stories. Yes. Send in your deer cams. We haven't had a deer cam for a little while. And that's yeah, fine. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Who cares? We, uh, that's, that that, that uh, segment might be done. Who knows? Yes, maybe. maybe. Um, did we, at our business meeting today, did we drink any beer? We did. Uh, did we get any donations for beer this week? I think we did. Yeah, they're the same ones as last week, actually. <laughs> of course they are. Of course they are. Uh, so, yeah. Thank, thank you, Mel. Mel and Andrew T again. Lovely. We forgot, to, we forgot to mention him that first time. Now he's like, well, if you don't, if, if you forget me, I'm just going to keep buying your beer. That's right. Uh, I'm just going to, as you keep going on with the show, I'm just going to yes. quickly see. Check and make sure got... that no other beer donations are coming in the meantime. Because, <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, so, Maybe. So you can go to dsps.com.au, folks, and we have a little button there that says buy us a beer. If you like the show, if you want to leave a little, it's like a little tip jar for us, really. We will buy beer with it, but we'll have you know. 
but yeah. uh, that's what it's there for. So uh, to show your appreciation, <laughs> if you yeah. want to, you don't have to. Absolutely. We don't care. Whatever yeah. you like, you, you yeah. might not. You know. And we, and we also need to thank uh, Jenny Cooper. She also donated a beer this week as well. Thank you, Jenny. We'll see Jenny on the weekend, I believe. I lucky I checked because we'll see her in a few days. And if we Jenny didn't gets a big her. shout out. She does. Um, Shall we make mention of the fact that we have one spot left on the Melly Workshop? I wouldn't worry about making that. Okay, out. We don't want that. We're going to be plugging it too much, wouldn't it? That, so if we if we put it out there that we've got one spot left on the Mally Murray yes. Mally workshop, you know what? By the time we run this Murray Mally workshop, I'll be able to pronounce it properly. Yeah, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe. So I think if we went out there and said, "Hey, we've only got one spot left," I reckon that might be plugging it too much. So okay. I, I wouldn't. We, we won't say it. that. Yeah. Well, I'll yeah. I'll cut that bit out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Speaking of the Mally, I got a warning on my phone earlier yes. about tornadoes Massive. in I'll the tornado. Mallee. A tornado wow. warning for the Mally. Yeah. Which is which is quite that, amazing. That, that, if we get that on the workshop, I'll be pretty impressed. I'm I'm the thing that I'm really excited about. So I went up to the Mallee in October last year, and there was a lot of wildflowers, mm, which okay. we haven't even mentioned yet. So this this year, I can guarantee you, now that I've said it, we're not going to see one. No, no. good on you, Jinx, the, the king no. of Jinx. Exactly. Uh, That's what it is. Cool. All right. Is that uh, that's over an hour, almost an hour and one minute? All People... right. Um, what do you got coming up? We know what you got coming up. You've yeah, got four podcast, got... four podcasts, four workshops in a row. Yeah. Which you'll be halfway through when this comes out. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. I'm home for the world. And you right. have got two workshops coming up with you. Yeah. What's the note say? Bellarine workshop. What's that stand for? LFG. What's been... LFG? You it's... might have to Google that. Mm. LFG. Never mind. I'm sure a listener will type it below. Um, That's really good. Have we have we done is that? It is that the podcast? Uh, yeah. Look, I reckon we need to make mention of one last thing. Okay. And that was that I chipped in from off the green today. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't and, let it go. Oh, and, now, and, okay. And on the path, right. and on the path three, you better you, you, look. I'll give you thirty seconds to people. We're going to talk golf. So goodbye to anyone who doesn't want to hear this. We'll see you next show. But. I played golf with this gentleman today and he uh, he's a bandit. He is a much better golfer than he makes out. He's of a, of a handicap that is way too generous, but that's fine. I, I, I understand how the handicap, handicap system works. <laughs> this dude had a ball that was basically in the face of a bunker. And yes. not only did he get it out of the bunker in one shot, it took one hop and went straight in a bloody hole. So yeah. that was outstanding. But yes. then on the sixth hole, which is the first of the par threes, which yes. is was playing 152 meters, if I remember rightly. What club did yeah. you use? I shanked the five iron. He, he hit a five iron that he said, oh, that's quite low and toey. And yeah. it basically slammed into the pin and almost went in for an ace. So... Oh it, was, it was a... It was a crazy day on the golf course. It was nuts. So and then the back uh, then the back nine went tits up and I went back Even to the my production daughters. the production meeting actually kicked in and so that's you right. lost all your focus. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we started talking <laughs> business and stuff. Um, <laughs> apparently right. apparently LFG is looking for group. No, it's not that. It's it's let's friggin' go. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. Well yeah. on that note, maybe we should go. I'm I'm just too old. Why am I trying to act like a teenager? That's it. That's the podcast. Thank you for listening to episode 82 of the Down South Photo Show. We will see you for episode 80. Are you going to be around next week? Uh, I'll be around next week, but don't forget our photo competition for June. Goodness me. How could we? No one's listening now. No one's listening now. It's pinned (laughs) on the Facebook page. Get on there. We've got about 40 shots up there already. So Facebook page, Down South Photo Show. It's about weather. So you have to put up your shot for June about weather. We'll pick a winner at the end. I'm done. Uh, We will bang on more about that next week. Thanks for listening to the show. We'll catch you next week. Bye for now. See you later.